I think we're waiting for the mic. Hi, everyone. Very, very warm welcome. How are you? Are you okay? I should say Jumbo, shouldn't I? Jumbo. Jumbo. <laughs> Mazzuri. Um, thank you very, very much for coming to Leicester's Curve. I've just posted my neighbour. Hello. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming to this incredible building, this iconic building. Uh, in just over an hour, you will be treated to three magnificent plays, uh, which obviously it's, they've been specially created to mark the 50th anniversary of the expulsion of Asians. Before the plays, uh, we will have a discussion, a panel discussion with our esteemed guests. We have Colin Grimes, who is a, a former deputy head teacher of a school in the town of Jinja, Sophie Kanabar, who came to this country from Uganda at the age of around six, Sir Peter Salisbury, uh, who is the, the city mayor. Uh, we also have Josveer Singh, who is from the South Asian Heritage uh, Month. Uh, and we also have Chandni Mistry, who is one of the writers of the, the plays. As you know, there are three plays. So today is quite an important day because it marks 50 years since Asians were told to leave Uganda by President Amin. He made that announcement 50 years ago, giving them 90 days to leave. His reason? Well, he said Asians were milking the economy. He said that Asians were not integrating with, um, with the indigenous African community. That was uh, something that was strenuously denied by community leaders. We know that Idi Amin was a man not to be messed with and when Asians were told to leave in 90 days at first they didn't believe it but they knew about his reputation because he was responsible for the deaths of between 300 and 500 thousand people and he was responsible for some horrific things in, in Uganda. We, we know that there were there was panic, there was chaos, there was bloodshed, there was uh, a lot of kidnappings that went on. Um, so it's really important that we don't forget what happened 50 years ago. So as I said, there will be a play, three plays in fact, uh, in just over an hour. But first of all, I'd like to introduce you to our guests. And first up to introduce himself is Colin Grimes. If you'd like to, to come up, Colin. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to share the memories of that uh, horrible period with you, but uh, it has to be faced. And unfortunately, if you look around the world now, perhaps we haven't learned quite so much and there's equal problems going on, or almost equal problems going on. I'd like to think in terms of this afternoon, I can speak with an almost unique perspective because I was right in the middle of both the Asian, the African and the European situation in 1972. I have to explain that at age 27, with my wife Norma and three children, age seven, five and two, I first went out to Uganda and was appointed as a teacher at Kira College Boutiki, which is about 10 miles outside of Jinja. But of course, we were immediately introduced to the Asian population because we had to go into Jinja for our shopping. And of course, most of the shops and the uh, people we dealt with there were from the Asian community and we very quickly struck up a lot of friends. For those of you who remember Jinja and have associations with them, I remember, for example, Jeff and George's as the, the two main grocers, uh, but uh, Kassam's electrical supplies, Anwar's and Kuna's garages, Tatani's Furniture, now Sports House, Ginger Jewelers, Madalani's Hardware, Keenan ba uh, Bakery and so on, 
In addition to the many smaller enterprises, such as uh, tailors, barbers, shoemakers, butchers, bookshops, and so on, that we all had to deal with uh, in, in order to carry on our life. Very shortly after the uh, end of the first year, the Amber Court Club in Ginger was reopened. Now, Amber Court Club had been built originally by the Uganda Electricity Board to give a social program for the expatriate builders of the Owen Falls Dam. It had been closed and fallen into disrepair, but by representations from the Asian community in Jinja, it was opened again in 1966. By this time, my wife had a job at Nyanza Textiles just across the Owen Falls Dam, and had a friend who lived literally next door to the club. We became aware of its opening, and we decided to apply for membership and were accepted. As I say, the membership was predominantly Asian, but there were perhaps 20 or 30 of us Europeans who joined in, were made very welcome, and as a result of that experience in that club, over several years, we made some very, very close friends uh, that have persisted, some of them, even unto this day. At the end of 1967, at the end of my first tour, I was offered a second uh, contract, this time down at Ginger Senior Secondary School in the heart of Ginger. And since it saved me about 40 miles a day driving up and down to um, between Nanza Textiles and the schools where my children were, I decided that uh, this would be very convenient. Ginger Senior Secondary School had been the Ginger Asian Secondary School and it had a four-stream intake. By 1967, it had changed its name to Ginger Senior Secondary School and had a 14-stream intake with 2,000 students. It was the biggest day school in East Africa. We had 1,000 students in the morning, leading up to A-levels, and we had the junior school 1,000 students in the afternoon. About a third of those students were Asians. Uh, the rest of them were African, and we, uh, again, maintained very strong links with the Asian community through my teaching practices. A third year contract followed, again, down at Ginger Senior Secondary School, and at this time, or by this time, I was actually chairman of the Amber Court Club. Uh, the chairmanship, again, uh, reinforced quite a lot of those uh, friendships that uh, uh, we had forged in the early days. Then came the time when I personally became involved in Amin's problems, or the problems that Amin Kate, uh, created after 71. This became particularly apparent when he started to exterminate his so-called enemies in Ginger Barracks. Now, most of the African students who were at my school were based in and accommodated with friends in the Ginger Barracks. Many of them were targeted and indeed executed during the course of early 1971, and I was uh, witness to many of those students actually going missing Many of them had come to me and asked for the return of their caution money and I uh, arranged for them to receive that so they could go back to their villages. Unknown to me, this was to have serious consequences personally. At the end of that contract, when I went to Kampala to renew my contract and arrange my service home, I got the suspicion that all was not right and I suspected that I was going to be allowed to leave the country and not return. On closer examination, the person came back into the office and said, I'm terribly sorry, Colin, you're absolutely right. Because you were helping your students at this time, your card has been marked as helping agents or our enemies of the state to escape. We're going to let you go home and your contract will not be renewed. I immediately arranged to have a three-month extension of contract, and this is in April 1972, extension of contract in order to settle my affairs and particularly to arrange to sell those uh, goods and household, uh, household items that I wasn't going to bring home to the UK. That included my car, which that and quite a lot of the rest of my household goods we sold to our Asian friends. Who was to know that only three months later Amin would make his announcement when all of these goods were absolutely worthless? You couldn't sell anything. At this time, I was fortunate, or we were fortunate, to be able to help some of our Asian friends. Because the amount of money and goods, the value, was limited to what we could bring out, 
I, because I was on a fairly lowly teacher's salary, had some spare capacity. So we were able to help one particular family by taking their cash, topping up our allowance and bringing home cash for them. At the same time, they asked and we agreed to bring a lot of jewellery out for them, which my wife and my daughter wore around their arms and necks with what was at the time the fashion, high necked and long sleeved blouses, and we managed to get through customs without any problems. This was nothing compared to the sights we saw at Entebbe Airport as the Asians tried to leave and take out their goods. You can see at the side what I would call is a sanitized version of what we saw at the time. Piles and piles of luggage which had already been checked through customs but were now being vandalized by the army, torn open, goods strewn across the runway. And we had to worry certainly whether our own goods were going to be uh, repatriated, but it was very clear that nothing was going to happen as far as the Asians were concerned. Fortunately, we got through customs okay, and we were able then to hand over the jewellery that we had brought out back to our, our friends, and we remained in touch with those friends for a few months. It was difficult for even us to come back to this country at that particular time, 1972. If I can just refer to my notes a second. <coughs> Readjusting to life back in the UK was a difficult enough for my family. Metrication of sterling currency, the emergence of self-service shops, precursor to supermarkets, a vastly increased consumer choice were all unexpected but minor challenges. Add to these factors rampant inflation, high rates of unemployment, the miners' strike, the three-day working week and regular power cuts, and this is saying nothing about the weather and the racialist abuse. I can, only hard, I can only begin to imagine the bewilderment of our Asian friends who must have wondered what kind of hell they were coming back into. Finding employment in the UK for myself was difficult. It took me six months. But of course, that was nothing compared to the difficulties and problems that uh, our friends uh, experienced. When I moved out of the education service to set up my own company uh, as a management company. I made use of Margaret Thatcher's Enterprise Alliance. And my business plan had to be approved by a representative from the Department of Employment. As the day arrived, the uh, uh, representative appeared on my doorstep. Imagine my surprise when it turned out to be one of my students from 1972 who was there to judge my business plan. Needless to say, my business plan was approved straight away. <laughs> uh, in 1981, having relocated the professional institute I was employed by to uh, Melton Mowbray, which is why I'm now here in Leicester, uh, imagine my surprise when I went into Syston, went into the bank to open an account, and lo and behold, the chief cashier was one of my old students. I walked into the local jewellers, again to be greeted by one of my old students. And this has gone on time and time again in shops and restaurants and other places around Leicester in the years that follow. I'm glad to say that uh, now I have retired after a very successful career and I've now begun to re-establish contact with a lot of Asian friends through the Lions Clubs International, through the University of the Third Age, uh, the Seisman District Volunteer Centre that I do some work for. And I'm delighted to say that those uh, links that we shared and the memories we now share about that wonderful country about which we were all so happy and so proud. And I'm so delighted to say that uh, we number amongst our current friends and active friends. We play mahjong together, we play bowls together, uh, we are very happily uh, again working together. All I can say is as far as uh, the total experience is concerned, if again you will allow me to quote from here, Looking back, I can only commend the Asian communities for their success, not only in surviving those very serious early challenges, but through their industry, intelligence and family values, from rapidly developing into an essential part of our local and national economy and enriching our cultural landscape. If I had a hat, I'd raise it. 
All I can say at the moment is Santi Sana. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sophie Canabar, previously known as Silpa Banditani and also Shilpa Ditani or Shilpa Canabar. So as you can see, I've had a bit of an identity journey um, and I'm happy to talk about it. My earliest recollection of Uganda um, so, as Rajiv mentioned, I was five turning six, and I remember being at the airport with my parents, looking at my mum, and my mum was seven months pregnant with my baby sister, and just looking up and saying, Mum, where are we going? And as you can imagine, the airport was chaos, absolute chaos, and she looked down with a tear in her eye, and she said, I don't know, I honestly don't know, but she goes, don't worry, everything will be okay. And that memory, and I was clinging on to her sari and a, a murti, a jalara murti that I had in my hand, and I keep to, to this day because they are just profound in just reliving that and, and you know the fear, the unknown, um, coming to England. It, it was just, it was it was so traumatic, and I can actually say it was a trauma. Um, we were then housed into one of the camps and then uh, we were allocated a place to live in Ilkley in West Yorkshire where we were the only family of colour so we faced humongous amounts of racism um, and my mother throughout that and my father were so tough and as Colin said if anything if anything they've given us that resilience and strength um, I've now carved a very successful career um, within within the UK um, and I have gorgeous children who are doing incredibly well but I think there's a there's a lot to be said on both both continents really Africa gave us a home and threw us out England gave us a home and didn't want us so um, I think I'm still re carrying on that journey and happy to take any questions about that whole experience from the audience thank you story uh, because uh, I'd come to Leicester in uh, the late 1960s as a student uh, and uh, I'd come from suburban North London and even before the arrival of those who were kicked out of Uganda, Leicester was an infinitely more interesting place than suburban North London uh, and it had diversity great as it is today, but it had a diversity that uh, I found fascinating and uh, was, I think, pretty determined almost from the soon first so year I got here uh, to, uh, to make my future here. And by the time uh, of the news of what was happening in Uganda uh, hit us, uh, I'd already joined the Labour Party and I'd already got involved in a small way in the politics of the, of the city. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I was deeply ashamed of what some of the leaders in my own party here in the city did. Because they put an advert in the Ugandan articles saying, and you've all seen it, and many of you might have read it at the time, uh, whatever you do, don't come to Leicester. Um, Manzo Mogul, uh, who I think some of you will know, uh, has uh, always claimed it was gloriously counterproductive because it produced, uh, people say, well, must be something in Leicester that's drawing people there, and uh, no, perhaps we ought to be. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, it's a it's an interesting uh, version of uh, of it. Um, but uh, fortunately, you know, it didn't stop people coming to Leicester. Uh, although, of course, there went many other places first in some cases, uh, and eventually uh, gravitated to Leicester, but some uh, sooner rather than later. But um, of course, what they were met with here is. Uh, Incredibly mixed. I mean, it really is. Some enormous generosity of feeling. I mean, there really was. And, you know, people talk to me, you know, with enormous affection for the generosity that was shown to them. But they also remember the hatred that was there. I remember uh, from those, those periods the NF letters, you know, on, on, on walls of graffiti. Uh, a constant reminder 
Uh, I remember that the Soviet set up a, an, organization, an organization called Unity Against Racism. It was all, all parties got involved in that, to, to their credit, uh, including my own. But um, I got elected to the City Council actually uh, the following year, uh, in uh, what was uh, 73. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, the new intake of councillors moved out of the leadership of the council, the people who were responsible for that advert. Uh, it's one of my sort of proudest you know, political memories, really, looking back on that. Uh, and uh, the leadership was replaced by uh, somebody who'll probably be remembered by somebody, Jim Marshall, who went on to be an MP and became leader of the council. Um, and, of course, what happened to Leicester, and perhaps we'll talk on this you know, when we come to, to answer questions, was something uh, very dramatic indeed. Because, obviously, people left with enormous anxieties and enormous suffering. Enormous, where are we going? Who knows? Uh, and, you know, what lies ahead of us? Who knows? But they brought very little, little at least. Hadn't the opportunity to, uh, you know, get anything out of the country. If you perhaps had, had the good fortune, foresight, perhaps, to, uh, to do that. But most hadn't. What they brought with them was in that... And baggage that they carried, and that was that was it. But what they brought uh, overwhelmingly was ambition, was skills, particularly entrepreneurial skills, but not only entrepreneurial skills, often manual skills as well. Um, and uh, what they brought as well was uh, a remarkable determination to engage into every aspect of the city's life. Um, and I've, you know, I, if you can just think about the, you know, the whole range of, of, of things in the city, you know, obviously from commerce and, and industry, you know, right the way through to civic life, politics, cultural life of the city, religious life of the city, all have been incredibly influenced for the better, and uh, you know, we've benefited enormously from it. Um, and of course, again, it, you know, perhaps in, in answer to questions, you know, some of the other things that the city's benefited from. Uh, it's a contribution that uh, they've, they've brought to the communities of Leicester and the celebration of festivals in the city that uh, are unparalleled outside of India. And uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. So, uh, a lot of things uh, to look back on with inevitable pain for those who are involved, some shame for what uh, initially happened in Leicester, but enormous pride what has been achieved as, uh, as a result of uh, all that was brought to, I'd say, every aspect of the city's life. So uh, that's uh, my Leicester bit. Uh, I'm going to pass on now to, no, no doubt, come back to some questions later. Uh, my name's Jasper Singh. I'm one of the co-founders of South Asian Heritage Month. South Asian Heritage Month runs from the 18th of July to the 17th of August each year. And this is the third year that we have been having events. It's the first year that we've been having live events, in-person events. And when we were planning for South Asian Heritage Month 2022, the big anniversary that everyone was talking about was the 75th anniversary of the events of 1947, the creation of Pakistan, the independence of India, the partition of Punjab and Bengal. Very few people were talking about the 50th anniversary of the expansion of Ugandan Asians. And it was something that we were very much aware of. My aunts were born in Uganda, uh, although they left Uganda at the age of about three or thereabouts. Uh, so there is a, a personal connection to Uganda. And it felt important for us at South Asian Heritage Month to mark the anniversary, mark the 50th anniversary of the order being given by the Amin, um, the 50th anniversary, as we all know, being today and also looking at the, the wider picture. What happened with the Ugandan Asians when they came to the UK? How were they treated? What were the responses? What was the reaction? Uh, but also, more importantly, the legacy. What can we see from today, looking into the past, and how can we use that to reflect towards the future? One of the themes that, well, the theme that we decided to go with for South Asian Heritage Month this year was Journeys of Empire. Journeys of Empire encompasses what happened 75 years ago in the subcontinent, but it also encompasses what happened 50 years ago. The expulsion of Ugandan Asians, that forced migration, is a story of empire. It's a journey of empire. 
and the fact that so many of the Ugandan Asians came to the UK and decided to settle here shows just how much that story continues. Now we've heard um, Sophie talking about the trauma that was being felt at the time. I would go one step further and I'd say that there's a collective trauma that exists to this very day. And that collective trauma is amongst South Asians, not only for what happened 75 years ago, but amongst Ugandan Asians as to what happened 50 years ago. And that is part of the lived experience of being South Asian and British. And that's why it's so important to have the work that's been done in Leicester, to hear the Leicester story, to hear about how uh, the situation was um, when Colin came to the UK and left Uganda, and also the work that's been done by Jamie and others, the plays which have been put together, the artistic response, the cultural response, because that's going to be what lives with us after this anniversary has gone past. The final thought that I would like to leave you with before we move on will be this. When it comes to being South Asian or having that connection with South Asia, the lived experience is the important one, but it's also important to be authentic and to live that authenticity. And to be able to talk about our own experiences, historic, present and in the future. And the fact that we're able to do that today is important, and the fact that we're able to do that 50 years to the day when the expansion order was made is something that we should all be very proud of, that we can have this conversation, but let's remember that this is something that we need to continue for some time to come. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name's Chanmi Mystery, and I work here at Curve Theatre. Um, I am also an actor, uh, but for this I have written one of the three plays. So hopefully tonight a lot of you will be sticking around to watch uh, the Finding Home plays that are on this evening. We've got 90 Days, which is written by Ashok Patel, and the writer is right there, so give us a wave, Ashok. Um, and some of the cast are up there too, I can see them. Um, and then we've got Call Me By My Name, which is written by Dylan Raitatha who's not here, but has been inspired actually by, all, all the plays have been inspired by the community and especially Sophie. So it's lovely to see you again. Um, so I just want to talk very quickly about why we've chosen to do this at Curb. So back in December, they put a call out to say, we want some writers who've got some lived experience or some experience of, you know, Ugandan Asian uh, exodus or some link to it. Would you like to write some plays? And the three of us uh, got the job, so that was exciting. Um, and we decided that two of the plays would be a show for adults, so you guys, so that's the ones that you'll be watching hopefully tonight. And I have a real interest in family theatre, so theatre that you can bring your 70-year-old grandma to, but also your six-year-old granddaughter to. And I think that's so important. So I decided to write a show for families, so my show's on only on the weekends. Um, and it's a way for us to educate the next generation because it's so important. We're sitting here today um, and I am, my dad's over there, hello dad, um, and he's from Ginger uh, and he left and we went back a few years ago and we went and had a look and as he was showing me and telling me things, I couldn't believe that I'm now 35 and I didn't know half of those things that he was telling me. That, you know, my grandma sat there and cooked cassava chips on the corner to the school kids that probably went to your school, Colin. You know, so it's, it's those stories that we wanted to show in these performances. So we led some chai and chat sessions with our director, Mandy, and the, the writers. We went out and we met, hopefully, some of you guys. We met Sophie anyway, um, and we found out the stories and I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't easy because everyone likes to talk about the mango trees and how hot the weather was and how lovely it was and how we did nothing wrong and we just got kicked out. And it took a long time, a lot of digestive biscuits and a lot of tea uh, with some of those uncles and aunties to really get the deeper stories. What was actually going on? What were the nitty gritties that people don't want to talk about today? So when you watch the performances tonight, and if you come back and watch Rooker on the weekend, I hope you see that we have tried to show a little bit more than the usual side of the story. And we are trying to talk to people and get the other side of the story as well. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say, um, if you haven't been to Curve before, then welcome, because it's so nice to have you guys in the
this theatre. You know, this is this is what we want. This is meant to be a community space, so we've got the community in. Um, the cast of the show are all the community. So if we do another community performance and you want to act, then you know, make sure you get in touch with me in the future. Um, there'll be some singing outside from the man from Africa. Um, I've got the chili guys out at the front. We've got our exhibition up at the top. So I hope that you enjoy your evening here today because we want Curve to feel like it's for you um, and that you feel very much part of this uh, this space. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so I will be speaking to Colin um, in a few moments, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions to our um, panelists, our guests. Uh, so put your thinking caps on because I'm sure you've got lots of questions that you might want to ask. Um, Colin, I'd just like to ask you, because um, as you said, you're in quite a unique uh, situation really, and unique in the fact that you are probably one of the few people in this room who'd actually met Idi Amin. Uh, what was he like? Oh, I... <laughs> Big. <laughs> Six foot four, I understand, wasn't Six he? And, four, uh, and a boxer. He was a heavyweight champion, wasn't he? He was, yes. But Six foot four, that was around the waist. <laughs> No, um, the only time I ever came into contact with him was, uh, I think it was at that time called the Imperial Hotel, uh, in the swimming pool there. I was there one day and suddenly this uh, army entourage arrived and this big guy in his uh, stripped off and, and dived in and I was gently urged to come out of the pool while he, he finished his length. And he made uh, a splash, I'll take uh, it. He, <laughs> he did indeed. Uh, he had the grace at the end of his two lengths to come and shake my hand but said absolutely nothing and then wandered off. But uh, uh, that's my claim to fame. Yes. I've, I've seen some incredible footage of it, I mean, because as you say, he was a keen swimmer and he would often swim in the Sheraton pool at the Sheraton Hotel. And sometimes he would swim against some champions, some, some leading champions. But funny enough, he would always win. <laughs> so I'm not surprised about that. But you also talked about that, you know, some of the horrific things that you saw, you witnessed as you described the exterminations. When people think about what happened in Uganda, we often hear about what happened to Asians, but it wasn't just Asians, it was uh, black Africans as well. If, if you were part of the wrong tribe, then you too would be targeted, and you saw that firsthand at your school. Absolutely. Um, uh, I said that uh, I was uh, asked for caution money to be returned. On one particular day, uh, I was faced with 30 students who were pleading to have their caution money returned. Caution money being a 30 shillings deposit they put at the beginning of their school career, which we held in case they did any damage or kept any textbooks, but it was kept on deposit for them. I said, I don't have that amount of money on the premises at the moment to come back this afternoon. When they came back this afternoon, only three of them were left alive. Three of them then we had to take, two of them we took uh, home in, in the back of my car and they hid in my garage until night and then disappeared and the other one decided to go off by himself. But that was actually stone cold hard up uh, against the, uh, the terror that was going on at the time. Their only, their only crime was they belonged to the wrong tribe. Simple as that. And you mentioned the terror, we know that I mentioned the bloodshed, the panic, the chaos. Um, that was felt by a lot of Asians, for, for tens of thousands of Asians, because there were around seven to 80,000 Asians living in Uganda at the time. Tell us what it was like, though, for, for non-Asians, for, for white Europeans who were living in Uganda. Strangely enough, we lived in a sort of um, unreal world. There was no animosity at all towards us as the European expatriate population. Uh, or indeed against those who had actually taken up Ugandan citizenship. We were, if you like, we rode above it. Um, I think my wife mentioned in conversation earlier that regularly she was stopped in her car by a roadblock going across the Oyen Falls Dam to get from our home to Naito factory, stopped by a roadblock because they were throwing bodies off the, other, off the, the dam into the water, African bodies of course, mainly. Um, but in being stopped, there was no animosity towards us, there was no threat towards the European population. We were, as it were, regarded as somehow privileged in that sense, and we were able to override or ride across. Now, 
the next question to arise is why did we not get very angry or disturbed at what we were viewing? Unfortunately, at the time, it's not something I'm proud of, it was something we took as a view was that's their problem, not ours. If we were to get involved, perhaps we would be threatened, so we tended to stay on the outside of it. I'm not, I'm not proud of that, but that's the reality of the situation. That's the, the reality. And, and Sophie, I know you were very young, as you said, five or six when you came here. But what are your memories of the time? And I can remember you telling me about a situation where you were hiding at one point under the bed. Just tell us about that and, and you know, what effect it's had on you to this day. So, um, my memories um, are quite, um, you know, they're not, they're very vivid. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, you know, I can recall certain things. And I remember asking my father, Dad, were there soldiers? And he said, yeah, but they were fine. And we know they weren't fine from all the history that we've, we've read about and heard about. Those soldiers weren't fine. I've um, been following a journey that my sister's been telling me about where the soldiers were around, they were stealing, they were raping, they were causing all sorts of um, violence. And my sister recalled a memory where she was being chased by soldiers after leaving school, and my father had gone with his friend in his car to find her. And, you know, there must be a God up there looking out for our family because she was fortunate enough to be found and brought home safely, and then hidden in panels within cupboards so that they wouldn't be found. And she was re reflecting how my mum would hide the three, three of us in these panels so that the soldiers wouldn't come and take the children. Um, it's just horrific. And you know, for me, the, the saddest part, I've lost both my parents and they never once talked about it. I think the trauma was just so intense and so immense that they just couldn't bring themselves to talk about it. They almost, you know, covered it up and said it, everything was fine. I think uh, I've watched the plays already and I, I look at the plays and I, I've been educated. I've learned things about how the black Ugandans were feeling, how perhaps we weren't fair towards them. Although my father always said that the people that worked for him or worked within our household, they were like family. You know, we all ate together, we all took, uh, washed together, we all cleaned together. But I don't think that was the same everywhere. Um, for me, it's just sad that I didn't talk to my parents or did push them enough to get their stories because they both passed away and I have just miniature stories from them. Um, and it, it's horrific when I hear some of the stories that Colin said and some of the ones that I've been educated on. It's horrific. And you mentioned the, the trauma and I think that there is still, there are a lot of people to this day from Uganda who are suffering, who are still coping with uh, the, the trauma, uh, with the, the mental anguish. I interviewed uh, a woman just a few weeks ago whose husband was kidnapped 50 years ago and to this day she is still wondering what happened to him. She doesn't know what happened and she still, although she knows the reality is that he's not alive, she still clings on to the hope. That itself must be so heartbreaking, not knowing what has happened. Um, do you think, Sophie, the fact that as Asians, we tend not to talk about what happened. Does that make it worse? Because there is no way to vent what happened. There is no way to, uh, there isn't a cathartic process, is there? Do you think that makes it harder? Absolutely. I think as Asians, we, we have this tough exterior that nothing affects us and we'll just carry on and we're resilient and we're strong and, you know, we'll just carry on. It's not healthy. You know, I've been, I've had a huge identity crisis of whether you know, I'm Asian, I'm Western, I'm Eastern, you know, and there's parts of our culture that I absolutely adore and there's parts of our culture that I'm quite embarrassed of and there's parts of the Western culture that I adore and again, parts of that, like the National Front, that I'm not so proud of. So I think as Asians, we, we really need to deal with trauma and talk about our trauma. It's so important and I think to the dying day when my father passed away and I said, can you tell me any of the stories? And he wouldn't. He just said, no, let's, let's move on. Let's forget that. It's not healthy. And I think I've done a couple of sessions with yourself, Rajiv, in the schools. And I just think it's really important that we acknowledge trauma and the trauma of leaving Uganda and the trauma of trying to reestablish a home in the UK. They're both different types of trauma. And for me, this has been very therapeutic, just doing these stories and talking to people. 
But when I've listened to you guys talking to people in Janney and, and the, the members of her team, it's been hugely important to do it and, you know, to mark this moment in history. So anybody out there who hasn't talked to their family or hasn't sought help, please do, because we had to deal with a lot. Um, and don't just take it for granted because it lives with you and it, it burns, it burns inside. And, you know, there's still parts of it that will, that will well up inside me and I, I write and I talk and I tell people about it. So for all those elders that are still around, please get their stories. Really important. And approximately five weeks after Idi Amin made that announcement, the first flight from Uganda arrived at Stansted Airport. That was on the 18th of September. So Peter, we know that many, many people came to Leicester uh, around 28,000 people came to the UK, a large number moved to Leicester. Um, the City Council, now you've been the City Mayor for many, many years, and the City Council has done a fantastic job in terms of welcoming people from, from all, all, all walks of life, all countries, all corners of the globe. But it was different then, wasn't it, 50 years ago? I know that you worked hard to, um, to fight against that, you weren't part of the local authority that placed that advert in the Ugandan newspaper. Why do you think that that advert was, uh, was placed? Uh, difficult question to answer. Um, the reasons that were given in the advert uh, may have motivated some of them, but social services, education, housing were under pressure in the city. Uh, and. It may well be that some of those who were motivated by that just wanted to try to uh, minimise the extent to which further pressure was put on the city. I say very short-sighted, very angry about it, but uh, you know, perhaps from their limited perception of uh, you know what was uh, what was coming and what what they could do and how the city could benefit. Um, they thought they were doing the right thing, but uh, I say that to make it forgivable. I just tried to explain it. I think it was quite a short-sighted approach, wasn't yeah. it? Because I think nationally, it wasn't just in Leicester, across the country, there was a feeling that the influx, the, the Asians that came to Britain, that would come to Britain, would be a burden on the state. But that couldn't have been further from the truth because Asians actually went on to contribute massively to the local and national economy, as you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, every aspect of the city's life has benefited enormously. And those who uh, did choose to come to Leicester and to, uh, you know, to ignore the advert or perhaps provoked <laughs> by the advert to, to think it was a good place to come to. But um, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the fact is that uh, it was uh, a dreadful thing to do, uh, but, and it is a big but, uh, for uh, many who did come, uh, they will remember kindness and warmth in the welcome. They will also remember the vicious, nasty, hateful uh, doctrines of the DNF and some parts of the city where uh, they wouldn't venture. It certainly wouldn't, tip, wouldn't let the kids uh, you know, venture out to, to some parts of the city in those early years. And uh, I think uh, you know, it's, a, it's a mixed uh, memory, really, of uh, some very good and some appalling behaviour from the uh, rest of the people. Uh, now looking back on it, you know we can uh, perhaps uh, you know perhaps gloss over some of those uh, those the, the, those you know the, those less uh, uh, good parts of it. But uh, I think uh, you know obviously uh, what the city has got from it is is just so enormously positive that uh, you know perhaps it's easy easy to forget just uh, how difficult it was for the people and what a trying time it was uh, for those of us who are seeking to find racism in the city. Very much so, and you alluded to the fact that the, possibly the City Council uh, made an own goal at the time because a lot of people actually came to Leicester as a result. Yeah, I mean, you know, whether it really was the result, I don't know, but, uh, but they did come to Leicester, and Leicester benefited enormously from the fact that they did. And, as I say, the one bit that I'm personally proud of is that uh, within well, less than 12 months, uh, of uh, that advert appearing, uh, the leadership of the council was dramatically changed and the new generation uh, took their place. But it was interesting, when you see the pictures of the uh, delegation that uh, went down to see the Home Secretary, to try and persuade the Home Secretary to uh, 
get the Uganda Resettlement Board to uh, tell people to go somewhere other than Leicester. Um, you do see it was all the political parties on the city council were, were there together uh, and felt that somehow they were putting up a common front. Um, and uh, you know, sadly, my own party was a part of it. And Sir Peter, looking back at what happened 50 years ago and the council's stance at the time, what can we learn from what happened and the stance of them? What can we learn now? Because we've seen what's happening in places like Syria, Ukraine, Afghanistan. One of the uh, most significant things, I think, was that those who came, came, say, with uh, you know, very little by way of personal goods, but did come with full civic rights and took advantage of that. They became engaged in the life of the city and the democratic life of the city most particularly. It was only a matter of a very few years before uh, the, uh, the city council uh, you know, had amongst its number a very significant number of those who uh, you know, you know, had uh, Uganda or elsewhere in East Africa as their, as their uh, you know, immediate origins. Um, and of course we saw uh, Gordon Palmer elected as the, uh, the Lord Mayor within, I don't know, 10, 12 years, I can't remember quite how long it was, but it wasn't very long. Uh, and, you know, and there were others there, and it was that engagement in the, in the life of the city. And I think that uh, it's a lesson for us, with others who choose to make their lives in, in Leicester, and for other towns and cities, that enabling engagement in all aspects of the life, particularly in you know, its, its civic governance, uh, is something that uh, you know, ma you know, makes uh, whatever takes advantage of what they have to offer, but also you know, make sure they're fully engaged in the life of the city in the way that uh, you know was possible with the United Nations and those others who came from East Africa. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, I did say there will be some questions uh, from the audience. So, does anybody have? Any questions for uh, for any of our guests? Um, I've got lots of questions, but we would like to throw it open. Just raise your hand. Would anybody? Uh, yes, uh, at the back there. Yeah, I don't, I'll acknowledge that uh, you know the uh, experience of those who uh, arrived in Leicester was, uh, you know, sometimes you know they felt very warmly welcomed, but often uh, found uh, an atmosphere that was very hostile to them. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, you know there were some things that the council did that uh, you know helped with that. Uh, some things that I think were less effective. Uh, but I do think that the way in which uh, so many became engaged in uh, the organisation I mentioned earlier, Un Unity Against Racism, uh, you know, which came from a wide range of political uh, backgrounds, uh, was a reflection of the fact that uh, the sort of experience you're talking about was still far too common uh, and uh, far too widely experienced. Um, and uh, I think we've come a long way, but even today I'm not complacent about it. Okay, we'd like to get some more questions in. Uh, first of all, uh, Rupal, you've got a question there. Yeah, I, I, it's a question to Peter. Um, I know that you, know, you weren't responsible or your, your party wasn't responsible for, for, the, for the advert, but on this 50th anniversary, is it, is it something you would consider doing, uh, issuing an apology to Ugandan Asians in Leicester? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, it, I think the, you know, my party should be deeply ashamed that uh, any of its members had anything at all to do with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not a personal apology, but it's an apology on behalf of, uh, of those who uh, went before me. Uh, they should never have done it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've said that so many times uh, over the years. Uh, all I can say in mitigation is that uh, we removed them from power very shortly afterwards. Uh, but that doesn't alter the fact that it should never have happened in the first place. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and if, if anyone whose phone is ringing, please put your phone on silent because it will ring again. Um, um, there's a question from the gentleman. Um, yes. Just a question on the coin, presumably the only one who knows. 
had, Idi Amin was obviously welcomed. In fact, when he became the president after the coup, he was welcomed by all the Cuban nations. Does he have a reflection on what that was about and what turned him against the Asian community that had welcomed him in 71? African politics is very difficult to get a grasp of. It is, or was, and I believe still is, very tribally orientated. Obote, in, well, by 1971, had produced something called the Common Man's Charter. And in that Common Man's Charter, he made it very, very clear that there was to be an aggressive program of nationalization and Africanization. The alarm bells were already ringing at that time uh, for those who were not of African origin. Once the coup took place, Abote was already fairly unpopular, certainly amongst the southern tribes, the Baganda and the, uh, uh, those uh, who were um, the Basoga, the Baganda, etc. He was already pretty unpopular. So when he was overthrown, the southern states particularly were overjoyed and of course they were joined by those of the Kakwa up in the northwest because that was his tribe. So there was a sort of unification initially uh, for a change of government and the potential for the aims and objectives of the common man's charter perhaps to be put to one side. That being the case, then the Asian and the uh, European community also sort of breathed a sigh of relief because they were watching what had been going on over in Kenya and in Tanzania where Africanization was already going on at a great pace and people were being uh, not ejected from the country but finding themselves unemployed and given no option but to decide to leave, which is a slightly different scenario. But it's true to say, I think, after the overthrow, of, uh, I mean, was popular, but very, very quickly into 1972, uh, on the, uh, the incidences I was, early 71, sorry, and the incidents I was talking about is uh, cleansing the, uh, the army of uh, factions which were antagonists towards him, uh, the overthrow of local government officers, the uh, public execution of mayors uh, in, in the various towns, uh, people very, very quickly became subdued and realized that uh, protest was a very dangerous thing and the whole thing sort of um, subsided. Um, but initially, because of the, uh, uh, the, the relief from the Abote direction, the Common Man's Charter, and the pleasure from the Northern tribes who thought they were now going to be better represented, uh, that represented uh, and was shown as rejoicing for a change in government proved to be a short-lived and just a veneer on, on the whole of society. Colin, thank you uh, very much. You are an expert on yeah. <laughs> Idi Amin. Um, we are going to try to get through a few more questions. And so if the guests could, could try to be as brief as possible and we can uh, get through some more questions. So the gentleman just there, yes. On a more positive note, um, I worked in Belgrade in a primary school in Belgrade from 74 for 15 years. And I've got very positive memories of working with the communities there. Um, we, we hadn't had any experience of working with those children before, but we bent over backwards to try to make sure that we valued the, the culture that they brought and, the, and everything else. So, you know, those, those very, very positive memories, I hope, are reflected in people's memories and there were many positive memories um, from from the local community and people that were here before the expulsion. There was a lady that in the audience today, Pratibha Mem Kadaria. She was here in 1970, and um, so two years before the expulsion, and she lived in a two-bedroom house just off uh, Belgrave Road, off Loughborough Road, Shirley Street. Um, at the time of the expulsion, 40 members of her family in Uganda said. I want to come and stay with you because we know a lot of people stayed in resettlement camps and she because she's a lovely hospital woman she said yes so she had 40 relatives staying in her two-bedroom house with one bathroom can you imagine uh, in those days 
Um, and, and everything was fine, but one of the neighbours complained, the council went round thinking what's going on, you know, we've got a slum landlord. Um, and when they went in, they saw everyone was happy, they were being fed, and in fact they ended up praising Brathi Barbain for doing a fantastic job, and they offered um, help. So there was a, a lot of good spirit at the time as well. Um, any more questions? Uh, yes, the, uh, the gentleman uh, with the glasses, yes. Okay, if, um, if Josephine would like to answer that, and as I say, if we keep it brief, then we can get uh, maybe one or two questions in, because we're approaching, uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left now. So, South Asian Heritage Month is about British identity, it's about being British. The story of what happened in Uganda, the Ugandan Asians coming over 50 years ago, that's part of British history. And South Asian Heritage Month is here to promote that, I, that understanding of whatever's happened in, say, as I was saying earlier, 1947 in India, Pakistan, that's British history. What happened 50 years ago in Uganda, that's British history. Ideally, I would like the month not to exist. And I look forward to the day when we don't need to have the month. But I look at Black History Month, that's been around for 35 years this year. That started in South London in 1987. That's not going anytime soon. And so I think South Asian Heritage Month will be here for a very long time, but it, we would like to have British history reflecting the diversity that exists in Britain and for that to be taught in schools. And I was quite lucky, I'm, I'm from London and in my school, uh, my history teacher was Jewish. His parents had survived the Holocaust. And he was very much interested in making sure that people knew about their own histories and knew about their own authentic identities. And I think we need to have more of that in school, really. I think the education side is really important. And my friend, uh, Bridget Raichuri and I, we are actually visiting schools um, across Leicestershire to, to raise awareness about what happened. Uh, I think we've got time for one final quick question. Alan, you had a question. Well, I, I was just going to say, I was really sorry to hear what Sophie said about not feeling welcomed. I mean, there were people like me out on the streets protesting against the National Front, yeah. but I'm, I'm working as chair of BUA 50, and we're collecting some oral histories at the moment. And one of the main things we're doing is talking to some of those volunteers who came out at the time, who had never seen anyone of colour, <coughs> but welcomed them. And I mean, I think there are some fantastic stories there. Um, personally, and, uh, and we, we are in no way a political project, but I mean, I think the more that we talk about this story, and you're right, Jim, people don't know about the story, but the more we talk about it as a success story, and the way that people have contributed in such positive ways to British society, the better, um, as far as I'm concerned. And I think via our project, we will be doing that as much as we can. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you very much to our guests. I think they all deserve a big round of applause. I'd also like to thank you for, for coming along today because that's really, um, it's really great. It's a fantastic uh, discussion, really interesting. I'd also like to thank British Ugandan Asians at 50 because they are the ones who've made this discussion possible. They've done a great job touring the country. If you want to know more about them, just have a look on Google, British Ugandan Asians at 50. They've got a really comprehensive website with some great interviews, they're touring the country, in fact the exhibition that is here today is upstairs on the mezzanine, try to take a look. They are also having an exhibition and an event at the, the National Archives 
on the 17th of September. That's at Kew in London. You can have a look at the wonderful gardens as well while you're there. And um, I'm a reporter with ITV News Central and we thrive on breaking news. I've just had some breaking news about an hour ago. They told me about a really prestigious event that is taking place uh, in London the following day on, the, on September the 18th. And that is taking place at Guildhall in London. It's quite a high profile event that is a special guest cannot reveal who that special guest is, but it is very high profile. Invitations will be sent out to people in Leicester, so watch out, keep an eye on your, your emails and have a look at the post every day from now. But thank you very, very much, and uh, I hope you enjoy the play in just over an hour. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Fantastic. You're happy? 